I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Steven Friedenberg to the stage. Welcome, Dr. Friedenberg. Hey, John, how are you? So Dr. Friedenberg is an assistant professor of small animal emergency and critical care medicine and genetics at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Friedenberg received his DVM from Cornell University and his PhD from North Carolina State University. He is board certified by the American College of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care, and his primary interests include autoimmune disorders such as Addison's disease and autoimmune hemolytic anemia. His research focuses on understanding the genetic and immunologic mechanisms that cause these diseases, as well as complex cardiac and neurologic disorders in dogs. Today, Dr. Friedenberg will speak on research insights into canine Addison's disease. Thank you again for joining us, Dr. Friedenberg. Uh, thanks so much, John, for the, the warm introduction and, and thank you everyone for, for being here and listening. Um, as John mentioned, my name's uh, Dr. Steve Friedenberg from the University of Minnesota. Um, and I spend a lot of my time these days thinking about Addison's disease in dogs. And, and I'm really happy to be here with you guys today um, talking about a disease that, that I care a lot about. Um, so I'd like to start off by giving you guys an overview of what we're going to talk about for the next uh, 40 or 45 minutes or so. And I've broken this talk up into three different sections. So first, we're going to start off by talking about the pathophysiology of Addison's disease, like how we think it actually happens and develops. Second, we'll talk a little bit about the clinical presentation and treatment of Addison's disease. So when patients with Addison's disease come into the clinic, what do they look like? How do we know they have Addison's disease? And how can we get them through the crises that they present with? And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about some of my research findings and ongoing studies. Those, those topics are in genetics, immunology, and, and some work I'm doing currently to try to understand environmental exposures that might lead to Addison's disease as well. So let's start off by talking a little bit about the pathophysiology of the disease and how Addison's disease develops. So to understand Addison's disease, the first thing that we need to think about is what organ it actually affects. And Addison's disease is a disorder of the adrenal glands. So you can see in the slide here on the left, there's two pictures of kidneys. These are actually kidneys from humans, but on top of the kidneys, there are these two glands, there are these triangular shaped glands that live on top of the kidneys. And that's the organ that's affected in dogs and humans with Addison's disease. If you wanted to turn this in, into a dog view, you would just rotate those kidneys 90 degrees. And we think of the adrenal gland as living in front of the kidneys in a dog. A lot of times when we're looking at the adrenal glands, when we're imaging the adrenal glands in dogs, we do it under an ultrasound guidance. And this shows you a picture of what an adrenal gland looks like in an actual dog. It's this kind of peanut shaped organ that again is located just in front of the kidneys. Now to understand a little bit about how Addison's disease develops, we have to break the adrenal gland up into some smaller pieces because Addison's disease, in Addison's disease, only a certain portion of the adrenal glands are affected. So if you were to take an adrenal gland and blow it up under a microscope, you would see that there are two main sections of the adrenal gland. This outer section called the adrenal cortex and the inner section called the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal medulla is actually, a, believe it or not, a totally separate organ from the adrenal cortex. And the adrenal medulla is actually really part of the nervous system and is totally unaffected in dogs with Addison's disease. The adrenal cortex, however, is a different story. And essentially what happens in Addison's disease is the body decides it's going to attack the cells of the adrenal cortex and ultimately destroys all of the cells that live in the adrenal cortex while leaving the adrenal medulla completely intact. Now, obviously losing all of the cells that are in part, part of an important organ in the body is never really a good thing. And in order to understand how some of the effects of Addison's disease actually manifest in our patients, we actually have to zoom in a little bit further on exactly what's going on in this outer layer of the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex. So this next slide breaks that up a little bit further. 
So you can see on the left, there's a cutaway of the adrenal gland where it's broken up into the cortex and the medulla. And if you zoom in on the cortex itself, you see these kind of light pink and darker pink sections of the adrenal gland. These sections of the adrenal gland are actually broken up in the outer layer of the adrenal gland, sorry, the adrenal cortex is broken up into three sections in and of itself. We call it the zona glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. And those names are not really important, but what's important to remember is each of those three layers produces different hormones that are really important in the body. And the, the two outermost layers of the adrenal cortex produce really important hormones, one of which is called aldosterone, and one of which is the other of which is called cortisol. And in dogs with Addison's disease, the body can no longer make those key hormones, aldosterone and cortisol, because these layers of the adrenal gland have been destroyed by the body. So what do these hormones, aldosterone and cortisol do? They have really, really important effects on the body. And oh, and, and sorry, before we get to this, I'm gonna just, I'll show you. So when we actually have a patient with, with Addison's disease, the immune system cells, so this whole blob of blue cells that are in the middle are actually cells that are in the process of destroying the adrenal gland of the dog. Those are called inflammatory cells and they're part of the immune mediated process that destroys the adrenal cortex in dogs with Addison's disease. So again, just getting back to the hormones and what they do. So the first hormone that we talked about that gets destroyed in Addison's disease is a hormone called cortisol. And the simplest way to think about cortisol is cortisol is like the stress hormone in the body. So when your body encounters a stressful situation, it reacts by secreting cortisol, which has a whole host of effects in the body. And the most important ones for Addison's disease are the ones that I've highlighted here in red. So cortisol, for example, stimulates the production of glucose or sugar by the liver. It also counteracts the role of a, a hormone called insulin. So we all may have heard of insulin because it's important in, a, in the disease called diabetes where patients don't have enough insulin. In patients that have don't have diabetes, cortisol will counteract the effects of insulin and actually help raise our blood sugar. There are also important anti-inflammatory effects that cortisol has, so tamping down the immune system response in various conditions. And cortisol also has important roles in regulating the tone of the smooth muscles in our blood vessels. And all of these become really important when you lose the production of cortisol in patients with Addison's disease. The other hormone that I mentioned that's really important is this hormone called aldosterone. So aldosterone normally gets secreted by the adrenal glands and it goes into the blood. And you can see in this figure here, aldosterone is represented by those green circles on the right that are circulating in the blood. And I've labeled one of them that says aldosterone. Once that blood gets to the kidneys, the aldosterone can cross into the kidney cells. And that's this big box in the middle, which is called a principal cell. It binds a receptor that lives in the cells of the kidneys. And what it does is it tells these cells of the kidneys to insert other receptors that are responsible for taking up sodium and excreting potassium. And those are really, really important normal functions of the kidneys to reabsorb sodium and to get rid of potassium into the urine. And if we don't have aldosterone floating around in the body, the body no longer can absorb sodium and it can no longer get rid of, it, it can no longer get rid of the potassium um, that it normally should get rid of. So what do we see then in our clinical patients is we wind up seeing in patients with Addison's disease, low blood sodium because it gets lost from the kidneys. We see high potassium because the kidneys can no longer get rid of sodium. We wind up seeing low blood sugar because of the effects of cortisol 
when the kidneys can no longer absorb sodium, the kidneys, the, it starts to lose fluid into the urine. So patients can become dehydrated, which often leads to shock from the loss through the kidneys. We see changes in the blood pH. We see difficulty in maintaining the tone of the blood vessels. And we basically see where the dogs are no longer able to generate an adequate stress response. And I've just color coded um, the different, different effects that we see. The ones here that are in purple are mediated by the loss of this hormone aldosterone. And the ones that are shown here in blue happen because of the lack of cortisol in the bloodstream. So these are all of the effects that we see in patients that are suffering from Addison's disease. So the last slide, which we, I have here, where I'm going to talk a little bit about how we think Addison's disease actually happens. And this comes from some researchers out of the UK who have studied this in people, is we think that what happens in Addison's disease, if you focus on the top of the slide where you see these gray triangles, the triangle represents the adrenal gland. And on the leftmost triangle, you can see it just looks like a normal adrenal gland. In stage one, what we think happens is there's a small area where the immune system starts to attack the cells of the adrenal gland. That area ultimately spreads to a larger section of the adrenal gland, as you can see in stage three. And then finally, sorry, in stage two, and then finally in stage three, the entire outer layer of the adrenal cortex gets destroyed and we're no longer to be able to make those hormones cortisol and aldosterone, which are so important for normal health. And if you remember back in the slide that I showed you a few images ago of a normal of a canine adrenal gland that's being a attacked, it almost looks like this, this red circle here that you can see in stage two, where you have these inflammatory cells that are in the middle of the adrenal gland starting to destroy it. So next, we're going to go and start talking a little bit about the clinical presentation and treatment of dogs with Addison's disease. So how does this actually show up when we see it in the clinic? Well, the first thing to know, and, and this is something that's really important, especially for folks who are, are breeders out there, is that Addison's disease can show up really in any breed. We see it all the time in mixed breed dogs and you know, really any breed that you might imagine, but Addison's disease is highly, highly overrepresented in several dog breeds. And there was a really great study that came out of Sweden a couple of years ago now, where they looked at insurance records from over 500,000 dogs. And one of the nice things about doing epidemiology studies in Sweden is that almost every dog is insured. So these medical records from insurance companies actually contain a lot of valuable information that we can use to understand the health of our dogs. And so when these researchers from Sweden looked at the incidence of Addison's disease across these 525,000 dogs, they noted that there were a couple of different dog breeds that were highly, highly overrepresented. And these are the dog breeds that I've highlighted for you in this red box here. So the number one overrepresented dog breed was Portuguese water dogs closely followed by standard poodles, bearded collies, Karen terriers, Great Danes, and Cocker Spaniels. And you could even see on the list that, but Portuguese water dogs and standard poodles are far and away the most represented breeds um, for in, in, in dogs with Addison's disease. Now, something that's even more interesting, if you look at the, the, the genetic history of, of dogs with Addison's disease, Oftentimes when we're looking at, at dog breeds, and, and, and I apologize that some of the breed names are a little bit hard to read on this slide, but this is um, what we call a, a cladogram. So this shows the relatedness of how, of how related different dog breeds are. So all of the dog breeds in this circle, if two dogs are right next to each other, that means they're highly related. And if they're really far apart from each other on a circle like this, that means that they're not very highly related. And when you start to look at where the dogs with Addison's disease fall on this, one of the first things that you see is these first circle that I've highlighted up here at about the 12 o'clock position, 
are standard poodles and Portuguese water dogs. So both of those dog breeds have really high incidence of Addison's disease, and they're also really, really highly related. So what that would suggest to us is that some ancestor, some common ancestor that ultimately gave rise to both Portuguese water dogs and standard poodles may have passed on the predisposition to develop Addison's disease. Maybe a little bit more, even more fascinating is that when you look at some of the other dog breeds that get Addison's disease, so the first one that I've highlighted here on the right at around the 5.30 or 6 o'clock position is the bearded collie, and the next one that I've highlighted here around the 8 o'clock position are Cocker Spaniels, you can see that bearded collies and Cocker Spaniels are actually not very highly related to standard poodles or Portuguese water dogs. So this could suggest that they actually have a different genetic basis for developing Addison's disease than we might see in standard poodles and Portuguese water dogs. And it just highlight, highlights the, the diversity of this disease and some of the reasons why the disease could be challenging to study if the genetic mutations that are variants that cause this disease in various breeds are actually a little bit different. So when we think about Addison's disease, I mentioned here beyond just the breeds, what else do we see clinically that's really important for folks to understand? So there are actually two different types of Addison's disease that we often see in our patients. And it's important, especially as breeders, to understand these differences because they can present very, very differently. So the first type of Addison's disease that we see clinically is a type of Addison's disease, which we call typical Addison's disease. And the reason we call it typical is because it's far and away the most common presentation of Addison's disease that we see. And in typical Addison's disease, we see an absence of both glucocorticoids, which are hormones like cortisol, and mineralocorticoids, which are hormones like aldosterone. So they're both gone because the entire outer layer of the adrenal gland gets destroyed. This type of Addison's disease is typically diagnosable on routine blood work that you might get at a veterinarian's office because typically on blood work, veterinarians will measure sodium and potassium levels that are highly altered in patients with Addison's disease. Typical Addison's disease oftentimes has a very severe clinical presentation meaning that patients can present in an adrenal crisis that requires going to an emergency room and treatment for some of these life-threatening electrolyte abnormalities that can actually cause the heart to stop. Um, typical Addison's disease also requires treatment with multiple hormones. So because both cortisol and aldosterone are absent in patients with typical Addison's, you have to replace those both of those hormones um, and the other kind of, the other type of Addison's that we see is, is unsurprisingly called atypical Addison's disease. Now, atypical Addison's disease is where we have an absence of glucocorticoids or cortisol only. And this is a little bit <clears throat> more difficult to diagnose on routine blood work because it doesn't show up with the classic electrolyte sodium and potassium changes that we see in typical Addison's disease. The presentation that we see is often more vague. So animals can present with just things like a waxing and waning appetite, intermittent vomiting, intermittent diarrhea that we can oftentimes chalk up to other common problems that we see in dogs. Addis atypical Addison's disease is in fact diagnosable, but it just requires a little bit more sleuthing on the part of veterinarians for one advantage of patients with atypical Addison's disease is that they only require treatment with one medication. So you only need to replace the cortisol that's lost. Um, and the other thing just to keep in mind, if you do wind up with a patient or you know of a patient that has atypical Addison's disease, sometimes atypical Addison's disease can progress and become typical Addison's disease. So that's just one of the things that we need to watch out for as clinicians and pet owners. So what do we see in terms of clinical presentation? So when I think of the clinical presentation for dogs with Addison's disease, especially as an emergency doctor, 
there are really two common ways in which Addison's disease will present. So first, dogs with Addison's disease can present in an Addisonian crisis. And what does that mean? So that means that dogs present in shock, secondary to the volume or fluid loss through the kidneys. We'll see dogs with things like pale mucous membranes, poor pulses, they'll be cold, they'll be dull. <clears throat> they'll have really significant electrolyte abnormalities. In particular, that high potassium puts them at imminent risk of death that we need to treat very, very quickly and urgently when we see them uh, in the emergency room, um, when we see them in the emergency room. The other way that Addisonian patients can present is a little bit more of a routine presentation. And sorry, just to mention one other thing, about a third of the patients that we see present in an Addisonian crisis, but about two thirds of them will present with this routine presentation. And that's where patients have these um, vague, non-specific clinical signs, like being lethargic, hyporexic, which means they don't like to eat, having gastrointestinal signs. So for example, intermittent vomiting and intermittent diarrhea, and these signs will kind of come and go. So they're waxing and waning. In terms of tr testing for Addison's disease, there's a couple of different things that we think of. So the most important test that we do first is a test called a baseline cortisol test. And you remember I mentioned that cortisol is one of the hormones that's not produced in Addisonian patients. So the first thing that we like to do if we have a patient that we think has Addison's disease is we just measure the baseline cortisol. Many veterinary clinics can just measure a cortisol in-house. Sometimes veterinarians will send cortisols out to a reference laboratory. If the cortisol is above two, then we consider the dog to be normal or healthy. If the dog cortisol level is less than two, the test is equivocal and means we don't really know whether or not the dog has Addison's disease. And that's because cortisol levels in even healthy animals can fluctuate throughout the day. And sometimes in healthy animals, they can just randomly be less than two. So greater than two rules out Addison's disease, less than two um, it is, is equivocal for Addison's disease. And so what we do next is we follow that up with a definitive test called an ACTH stimulation test. And this is a test where we take, we measure the baseline cortisol, we give a synthetic version of a hormone called ACTH, and that tells the adrenal glands, please make more cortisol. We wait an hour and then we test the cortisol again. And then what do we actually see from these patients, well, this is some data from my own lab where we have affected dogs on the left and unaffected dogs on the right. And the pink dots measure the, AC, the cortisol before the synthetic hormone is given, and the blue dots show what we see after it's given. And you can see in the affected dogs, there's no difference in the cortisol level before and after we give the synthetic hormone and we call that a flat ACTH stim test, and that's pathognomonic or diagnostic for patients with Addison's disease. On the right, you can see what we see in unaffected dogs, where the baseline cortisols might be below two, which um, before we, we run the test, but they, they go up much, much higher after we run the ACTH stim test, and that's what we would consider a normal presentation. So how do we actually treat these patients when they come in? So to some extent, the treatment depends as to whether or not animals are presenting in an adrenal crisis or whether or not they have more of a routine presentation. So in the crisis, the first thing we need to do is treat patients that are in shock. And a lot of times that involves lots of fluids. It involves medication that we can give to deal with the high potassium. And then from an ongoing basis, we treat them with a supplementation of the hormones that they've lost. For those patients that are typical Addisonians, we'll, we'll treat them with medications that can replace aldosterone. Typically, that's a medication in the US called Percortin or Zycortol. For both typical and atypical Addisonians, we need to treat them with steroids or, cord or, or um, prednisone at physiologic dosing. 
So that's typically how we treat these patients. And most of the time, I will sort of say that patients with Addison's disease do have a really good long-term prognosis. There's a study out there that's looked at life expectancy in dogs with Addison's disease and found it to be exactly the same as in dogs without Addison's disease. Um, as long as the, 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 the hormones, the replacement hormones are given regularly, and as long as the dog gets regular follow-up veterinary care. So now that we've talked a little bit about um, Addison's disease, the pathophysiology and the treatment, I'd like to move on for the next 15 or 20 minutes and talk a little bit about some of my research findings and ongoing studies that I have. So the long-term research goals or one of the main long-term research goals in my lab is really to understand Addison's disease fully. And so what I would love to be able to do is number one, be able to predict which dogs will develop Addison's disease. Number two is I'd love to be able to develop new ways of preventing and treating Addison's disease. And obviously being able to prevent Addison's disease really requires us to be able to understand which dogs are likely to develop it. And then finally, I'd really like to understand the environmental triggers because even though we think Addison's disease is in part a genetic disease, it's probably more of a disease that has both genetic and environmental triggers. And in order to understand fully what's going on here, I think we're gonna need to understand all of these things. So again, my approach here is really to think about genetics, immunology, um, and the environment and try to put it all together in understanding what's going on here with this disease. And we're gonna start off by talking a little bit about the genetics and some of the work that I've done in this area, as well as ongoing work that I have planned as well. So how do, how do, how do researchers pr pursue trying to understand how, what gene or what mutation in a gene causes a disease? So to understand this, I'm gonna walk you through what is a typical genetics roadmap that researchers will follow. So the first thing that we typically do is we do something called a genome-wide association study. And we're gonna talk a little bit about a genome-wide association study in a few slides here now. If we do a genome-wide association study, we're basically looking for regions of the genome. So the dog genome is about two and a half or three billion bases. So which of those regions of the genome is associated with a disease of interest, in this case, Addison's disease. If we find that region, we need to kind of delve into it and look a little bit closer, and we call that process fine mapping. Once we've sort of done some fine mapping and honed in on a region of interest, oftentimes we'll, we'll look at that the actual bases in that region through whole genome sequencing. If we find something, we'll validate those mutations or variations in larger populations of dogs. And then eventually we we'll might do some functional studies to look at how those mutations might actually change the biochemistry of an animal. And so this is typically how we pursue trying to understand um, the genetic basis of diseases. So uh, to understand what I've done, how we've approached this, I want to explain to everyone at a very high level, what is a genome-wide association study and what are some of the results that we typically see from this? So all of you probably know that the, the, the DNA has four different types of bases. We call them A's, T's, G's, and C's. And you can just see here in the top of this figure, a string of about eight or 10 bases, right? Just rec and this is, this is just a fraction of the genome of a dog. But except I mentioned, right, because the dog's genome has about two and a half or three billion of these bases. And scattered throughout the genome, there are these areas which we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, and we oftentimes abbreviate them with SNPs. And in this slide, I've shown you three example SNPs in this one stretch of DNA. So this means in this dog, the, um, the first one on the left, you could have either a G or a C, and it really wouldn't matter to the dog because these variations occur in regions of the genome that don't necessarily have any effect on the animal. In the second one, it could be an A or a G, and in the third one, it could be a C or a T. So what you do in a genome-wide association study is you try to find some of these variations, and you try to find those variations that segregate or are associated with a population of interest. In this case, a sick dog, a dog with Addison's disease, 
versus a dog without Addison's disease. So in the example here, if we were to find that all of these poodles with the green dot in the middle of them that are smiling have the G snip, and all of these sad poodles here on the right have the blue snip, these might be poodles with Addison's disease, that could mean that this G snee snip is in fact associated with dogs with Addison's disease. So that's kind of what we're looking for when we do these genome-wide association studies. So one of the first things that I did when I was trying to understand Addison's disease is we spent a lot of time working with breeders and owners like you to try to collect blood samples from dogs with Addison's disease and without Addison's disease. So we spent a lot of times, um, we, we collected dogs with, with Addison's disease. The, the genome-wide association study that I did was exclusively in standard poodles. We were very careful about making sure that they had Addison's disease. We also collected DNA from unaffected standard poodles that had to be at least 10 years of age, right, to make sure that they didn't have Addison's disease and without any history of having any autoimmune disease. And uh, we collected a total of 77 dogs with Addison, standard poodles with Addison's disease and 103 dogs without Addison's disease. And then we performed this experiment called a genome-wide association study. So what did we find in this study? So this is a typical plot that researchers often look at in, you know, in any kind of um, genome-wide association study. And this plot is called a Manhattan plot. And I'll explain to you in a second why it should look like we call it a Manhattan plot. But what you're looking in this, in this figure is each of the dots in this figure represents one single nucleotide polymorphism. So in the previous slide, I showed you three of them. When we do this in dogs, we look at about 170,000 of them all at one time. And the, the highness, how high each dot is on this plot, represents how associated it is with Addison's disease. And then the differences in the red and the yellow colors represent chromosomes. So the first the one on the left is chromosome one, then the yellow is chromosome two, then the next red is chromosome three, et cetera, et cetera, until we get all the way over to the X chromosome on the right. And what we like to see in Manhattan plots is we like to see essentially skyscrapers where you have some of these dots that go really, really high above the blue line here, which is a line of statistical significance. And no matter how we try, no, ma no, how many, no matter how many ways we try to understand this data, we could not find any SNPs that were associated with Addison's disease in this standard poodle population. And so this is a pretty frustrating finding for me as a researcher, but also interesting as well, because it does tell us a little bit about what's going on here with the disease. So why might we actually not see any significant hits on a genome-wide association study? And probably one of the most important reasons why we would see something like this is because the disease is in fact polygenic, meaning that there are many different genes that cause Addison's disease, but we just, because there's so many of them or different combinations of those genes are required in order to get Addison's disease, having only 180 dogs in the study might not have been enough to sort through them. The other thing that could happen is that we could for sure have some something called incomplete penetrance, where not every animal with particular variations goes on to develop the disease. There can di be different types of variation that we see in genetics that we don't necessarily see on these SNP arrays. So for example, you could have structural rearrangement in chromosomes um, that could cause variation and we might not see them necessarily on a genome-wide association study. Another possibility is that all standard poodles have some high degree of predisposition to developing the disease. And we really need to understand what the environmental triggers are that lead some dogs to get it and some dogs don't. So those are just some reasons why we might not see any significant hits. So we did a couple of things next to try to sort through what was going on. And I'm just gonna fast forward through a couple of slides just in the interest of time here. But essentially we decided we were gonna add about 80 more dogs to the study. We didn't find anything when we added 80 more dogs, but 
one of them, what we did after we added the next 80 dogs is we asked ourselves the question is, could we subset? So look at just a smaller group of affected dogs. And one of the things that we noticed in the population of the affected dogs that we had is they had a pretty wide range of the age at which these dogs were diagnosed. So this here, what you're looking at is a plot of a histogram showing you the age at which we had dogs diagnosed in our study. And on the y-axis is the percentage of the dog. So for example, about 15% of dogs were diagnosed less than one, 20% of dogs were diagnosed between one and two, another 20% of dogs were diagnosed between two and three, et cetera. And so what we did is we drew that red line that you see here in the middle, separating dogs that were diagnosed less than two years of age versus greater than two years of age, and just compared that population of dogs versus our unaffected dog. And here you can see this genome-wide association study we were, where we were able to get a really nice peak on chromosome 37 in this population of affected dogs that seems to be associated with Addison's disease. So this is a pretty interesting and exciting finding for us. Um, we're actually in the process of trying to sort through exactly what's going on on this region in chromosome 37. The other thing which I'm pretty excited to, to speak about just briefly here is we're also in the process of kicking off a study in Portuguese water dogs, which if you remember I mentioned were highly, highly related to standard poodles to try to look at the genetic basis of Addison's disease in Portuguese water dog dogs and ultimately combine this data with what we see in standard poodles um, and, and try to under, see if we can understand the genetics of Addison's disease in these two breeds together. And hopefully that by putting this data together, we're gonna be able to make some, some real progress in understanding what's going on, but it's a challenge and it's definitely all a work in progress that will take some time to sort through. So next I wanna talk, now that we've talked a little bit about the genetics and some of the work that I have going on there, I wanna talk a little bit about some immunology studies that I have going on, because these are also pretty exciting in terms of our ability to understand which dogs are gonna get Addison's disease. So um, in order to under think a little bit about the immunology work that I'm doing, we, I need to sort of just introduce you guys to the concept of autoantibodies. So antibodies have been in the news a lot lately as we all think about COVID and getting vaccinated, hopefully for COVID, where we generate antibodies against COVID. So autoantibodies are basically the same types of proteins. They're antibodies that are just generated by the body against itself. And, and so basically, yes, there are these proteins, they're generated by the body against itself. And these autoantibodies typically cause damage to end organs in different autoimmune diseases. So lots of different autoimmune diseases in patients will generate these autoantibodies that can serve as a marker for the disease. So for example, in dogs with diseases like type one diabetes, myasthenia gravis, masticatory muscle myositis, we can identify and detect these autoantibodies before the onset of the disease. And so the question that, one of the questions we're trying to answer in my lab is can we detect these autoantibodies in dogs before they develop Addison's disease? And there's really good evidence, so I'm, I'm not gonna go through these slides in a ton of detail just in the interest of time, but in humans with Addison's disease, almost all humans will generate autoantibodies against a particular protein called 21-hydroxylase in the adrenal cortex and developing those autoantibodies is about 90% predictive of which humans are gonna develop those autoantibodies, which humans, are, excuse me, are gonna develop Addison's disease. So a question that we had, as well as a question that other researchers have had, is do dogs develop those same autoantibodies before they develop Addison's disease? There was one really important study that came out from the United Kingdom back in about 2015 or 2016 that did in fact detect these autoantibodies in about 25% of dogs against a different enzyme, so not the same one in people, called P450 side chain cleavage enzyme. Now this study left out a couple of important questions though 
that we really wanted to try to answer, which is number one, trying to understand the breed specificity. Number two, trying to understand how, how soon after a dog is diagnosed do these autoantibodies develop. And number three, trying to so figure out exactly um, what part of the adrenal gland gets targeted by these autoantibodies. So we've been working on a study now for, I would say, about the past two or three years where we've enrolled dogs, standard poodles, Portuguese water dogs, and English cocker spaniels with and without Addison's disease. And we're recruiting these dogs in four different groups of patients. But importantly, we're really trying to recruit dogs in all of these breeds that are young and that they were diagnosed less than 30 days ago. And the reason why we're trying to recruit samples from these dogs is because these dogs that are really recently diagnosed are likely to have very, very high levels of autoantibodies. So we're recruiting samples from all of these dogs. Um, and one of the, and, and then what we're trying to do from these dogs is we're trying to take the serum from these dogs and trying to ask ourselves the question, does the serum from these dogs react with any proteins from the adrenal glands? And to do this, we perform an experiment called a Western blot. Um, and so what a Western blot is, is we take proteins from the adrenal gland, we run them out on a gel where they create all of these different bands, where each of these bands essentially represents a different protein. Then as you move along to the right in this slide, you apply the serum from the affected dogs, which are shown as these Ys, and you see what port, if the, these Ys represent the autoantibodies, do they bind to a particular protein from the adrenal cortex? And if you, if you see a difference between affected and unaffected dogs, you know that there are autoantibodies in the serum. And we've identified, in fact, what some of these proteins are from the adrenal gland. So um, I'm showing you here some preliminary data from our research. On the left, you see data from young, unaffected Portuguese water dogs. And on the right, you see data from young, unaffected, sorry, left is affected and young and on the right is unaffected. And you can kind of see on, these, on this gel that there are all these dots here, which represent different proteins from the adrenal gland. Well, if you look at it really closely, you can see there are these dots that we only see in the affected Portuguese water dogs, meaning that there is something in the blood of affected Portuguese water dogs that's binding proteins in the adrenal gland that we don't see using serum from unaffected Portuguese water dogs. We see the same thing in Cocker Spaniels and Standard Poodles. So again, you see these black blobs uh, represent proteins from the adrenal gland in both the affected on the left and unaffected on the right. And there are definitely some proteins that are bound only by serum from the affected English Cocker Spaniels. So, okay, great. So this, so as far as, in, as far as what we're doing now is we're kind of continuing our, our work on this. We're, we're, we're um, trying to understand, look at some individual dog samples and ultimately try to develop an assay or a test where we can identify not so much on a genetic basis, but on an immunologic basis, which dogs are gonna develop Addison's disease. And then just last before I finish up and, um, and, uh, and take some questions from you guys, we are, we are really curious about um, environmental triggers that might predispose animals to developing Addison's disease. Um, and we're in the process of doing an epidemiology study where we're survey surveying owners of animals with and without different autoimmune diseases, um, the three autoimmune diseases in particular, Addison's disease, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, and type 1 diabetes. And we're looking at some representative breeds, and we'll be working with different breed clubs and organizations um, in order to try to get this survey sent out. So it's some slow progress, but definitely progress. And, and I'd just like to take a second and acknowledge um, all of the funders here who've helped with my research, in particular, the um, American Kennel Club, Canine Health Foundation, the Poodle Club of America, English, English, English Cocker Spaniel Club of America, the Portuguese Water Dog Foundation, the NIH, um, and all the breeders and dog owners who've donated samples, um, as well as lots of folks in my labs and mentors. And um, with that, I'm, I'm kind of happy to switch over and take any questions that, that people might have. So just looking at the, at the chat here,
Um, one question came up if, as to whether or not I've, I've pursued any research into systemic lupoid oncodystrophy. Um, the answer to that question is no, unfortunately, I, I would love to sort of study another autoimmune disease. I, I know there's some folks out there who studied this, but um, it, it's just um, unfortunately not something that I've, I've had a chance to take a look into yet. Um, another question came up um, as far as how um, we manage, another question came up here, how do you manage at NSU indifferently through pregnancy um, or do you not recommend breeding them? So um, for sure, we do not recommend breeding dogs with Addison's disease um, because you know, if dog, because they have a, a relatively high chance of sending some of those genetic mutations um, that they might harbor onto their offspring. So for sure, I, I would, if you have a dog with Addison's disease, I would, I would recommend uh, not, not breeding them. Um, what percentage of non, of atypical Addison's become typical over time? Um, it's a good question and which I don't know the answer to, but uh, like it's, it's, I would say just based upon, and I'm not sure anyone's actually studied it either, but I would just say based upon my clinical experience, maybe about 20 to 30% of atypical Addison's dogs do become typical Addisonian dogs over time. Um, question here on, uh, on, uh, on other, other breeds that, that get Addison's disease. So Sluffies, um, it's a, a sight hound. Um, is Addison's disease always genetic? It, it's a good question. So we don't know the, the answer to that question. Is it always genetic? We sort of presume that it's it's at least partially genetic because we do see overrepresentations of Addison's disease within certain breeds only. Um, and that's part of the reason, for example, why we strongly think that it is genetic in poodles and Portuguese water dogs is because it is so, so highly overrepresented. Um, Question here came up about epigenetic factors associated with Addison's disease. That's a great question. So um, epigenetic factors are sort of, there, there's portions of the DNA where DNA will have, for example, different modifications that can change which genes are turned on or which genes are turned off, um, whether or not any of those modifications are associated with Addison's disease. That's not something that I've ever looked at. Um, it's a great idea. And I've definitely thought of looking at some of those things as well. Um, it, but it's just not something that I've ever had a chance to get to, but it, it's really a great idea and something that I would, I would consider doing. Um, and, um, oh, other, just another question came up about other research areas that I'm exploring. Um, so some other, other things, other, the other major disease that I spend some time working on um, is immune mediated hemolytic anemia. Um, so immune mediated hemi hemolytic anemia is a disease where the body attacks its own red blood cells. Um, and this can have some pretty severe life-threatening consequences for um, patients that get it. Um, it's highly overrepresented in Cocker Spaniels, um, English Cocker Spaniels, American Cocker Spaniels, and Springer Spaniels, um, although there are other breeds that certainly get it. Um, and so that's another disease that I'm working on as well from both a clinical perspective um, as well as a genetic perspective as well. So hopefully that answers a bunch of the questions um, that are out there. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Friedenberg. Uh, I know I know our audience is continually interested in learning about canine health research overall and autoimmune diseases in particular. So we really appreciate you taking the time to walk through the details and highlight the many steps that go into understanding conditions like this. Um, there was one comment actually from a viewer that stood out to me. Um, Heather from Harmony PA said, I didn't have any specific interest in Addison's, but now I appreciate how this illuminates how the basic science is done. So very informative. Um, and, and it was great to kind of hear you walk through it. So yep. thank you well, again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and thanks to Embark and thanks um, for everyone for coming to this and listening. And I'm happy to kind of take any follow-up questions by email at some point if, uh, if that's helpful. So thanks guys.